podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to the Hedged Edge by RCM Ag Services, where we're getting out of the field and onto the mic to bring you weekly market updates, commentary from commodity experts, and monthly interviews with the biggest names in agribusiness. Welcome to this week's edition of The Hedged Edge. I'm your host, Jeff Eisenberg. We like to bring industry veterans onto the podcast, well, because they've been focused on their craft forever. Their depth and width of knowledge is often unrivaled and can bring new ideas and viewpoints to even the most seasoned of farmers. Today's guest is no stranger to the term veteran. He spends most of his adult life or has spent most of his adult life at Helena Agri Enterprises and has nearly 20 years of experience in the agribusiness field. Dr. Greg Willoughby is the Technical Services Manager at Helena. We're excited to talk with Greg about the current trends and future of agronomy on today's episode. Thanks for joining us, Greg. Thanks for having me. Great, so you tell me uh, you're, you're in Lafayette, Indiana right now. Is that, uh, is that right? You'd say you just moved back there? So, yeah, so I'm actually a, a native Kentuckian. Uh, grew up in South Central Kentucky, went to Western Kentucky University, so I'm a hilltopper first, mm-hmm. um, and then moved to Indiana uh, and got another doc, got my doctorate at Purdue University. So I'm a hilltopper boiler maker. And, uh, so that's, <laughs> nice, nice. All right. Um, well, the boiler so that's maker, where I reside. Uh, let's say again. So, so that's where I reside at. Uh, that's that's good. Well, you know, Boilermakers uh, obviously had a uh, strong history, football and, you know, all their sports. So you got to you got to uh, be proud, be a proud Boilermaker. That's good. Um, yeah. Well, coming from Kentucky, you got a pretty good basketball SEC background, too. So. Oh, all right. Yeah. We'd like to talk Ohio State basketball here where I'm sitting. But, uh, you know, I guess we'll we'll battle that one out in the, in the <laughs> right. next, uh, yeah, next round of the tournament. But, there you uh, go. So, so Greg, let's get a little bit into your background. You know, first of all, you and I both have kids and I have to explain my job to them. You know, mine are a little younger than yours. They're they're 11 and nine. You've got some older, 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 uh, older kids. And, you know, I tell them I'm on the road. I'm meeting with farmers. I'm, you know, sitting in my office here during COVID and doing podcasts. And they're showing their friends a YouTube of their dad on, on, you know, on, on a podcast. But yourself, your company, the American farmer, you guys have one of the most important jobs in the world. You know, you have to feed the planet. I, I got I to gotta say, we all love you for that. But how do you get started in, in a business like this? So, uh, so my kids think of me as a plant doctor. And that's kind of the way I, <laughs> I explain well, my, my okay. job to, to a lot of people as a plant and a soil doctor. So yeah. um, when we grow crops, they can be sick. Um, they can get disease. They can be infested with parasites. Um, they have to quote unquote eat the proper nutrition. Um, so one of the, the the way I've always explained my role is is that I look at those plants and those soils, and I try to figure out how to uh, work programs, call it a diet, if you will. Um, for those plants to be able to maximize their full potential. So whether it's a nutritional diet or if it's a vaccination program, if you will, um, that's that's kind of the way I approach the whole business of, of crop production. Right, plant doctor, right? That's good, I see that as a new uh, PhD at Purdue <laughs> University. So that's, yeah. that's great. Wow, yeah, I mean, you start to really dive into what it means to you know, improve the health of plants. And um, I, I guess when you go all the way back to how you decided to take on this PhD, was there something in your background uh, growing up on the farm or something that you know, kind of pushed you in this direction? You know, you mentioned your, 
your son now also pursuing ag chemistry. I mean, what, what is it in the, in the Willoughby genes that kind of driving you this, this direction? So my family comes from a farming background. However, they come from a livestock background. So okay. I grew up on a dairy, dairy farm. So I milked cows when I was in high school. Oh, okay. Um, and, and showed dairy cattle. So my whole background is in the livestock industry and crops was just something that was on the side. Uh, when I was at Western Kentucky doing my undergrad, I actually started out in pre-vet. Okay. And uh, long story short, happened to take a class that tied weather, plant, and soils together. Um, ended up with a meteorology degree along with my ag degree. Wow. And then that kind of rolled into um, the agronomy side of how uh, weather and things interact with plants um, studied soils from a groundwater contamination standpoint, um, and then just kind of rolled from there. So, um, my two daughters basically grew up listening to me to do things like this or, um, doing extension work when I was on staff at Purdue. And, um, I think it's just kind of inbred to them that that's been the environment they've been raised in. So, well, I, I have two daughters as well, and uh, the older one certainly on the environmental track. So maybe uh, I need to have her come and visit with you uh, <laughs> a few days. Um, uh, that's exciting. Well, yeah, I can I can totally see how once you get started down that path, it's uh, it's almost like a rabbit hole, and you can't uh, really get right. out of it. And the timing for you and uh, getting involved in that in the I guess mid to late nineties. You know, we've seen a tremendous amount of growth and progress with uh, uh, seed and chemical and, you know, transitions from, you know, GMO, uh, you know, GMO to non-GMO and combinations of all of that. And I guess uh, before we get into some of those nuances, I guess, tell us a little bit about Helena and the work that you're doing for them. You know, obviously a massive company, uh, over 6,000 employees, 500 branches. I mean, you guys are really at the heart or the pulse of, of this uh, agriculture economy. Um, tell us a little bit about the business. Yeah, so, um, so Helena operates um, in the continental United States. Uh, so we have retail sales in all 48 states. Um, and we have done some work in Hawaii as well. Okay. Um, we're about, the, I think we're the second largest uh, agricultural uh, distribution company in the United States. And so we touch a lot of people. We have both a retail side uh, and a wholesale side. So you may be buying directly from a location that has a Helena side in the front yard, mm-hmm. or you may be buying from a local independent um, who we're actually supplying the products that goes into their warehouse. Um, And so that gives us a great feel for the business in that we have a direct contact with the farmer group. So we understand what the farmers are actually going through. Uh, But then on the flip side, because we have wholesale, um, we actually are tied into the business end of the deal to understand supply and demand and um, manufacturing um, supply challenges, which we're getting into this year. Um, and, um, so, so we have a pretty good feel of the whole, whole gamut, uh, from my role, I get to work with both sides. Um, and then I'm on the research and development piece. So I get to look at things that we develop from scratch or that we have access to from, um, agreements with, uh, other suppliers internationally. Uh, and we develop products from that. So I get to see how those work, help evaluate those um, before they are brought to market. And then there's a group of agronomists that I work with in the Midwest um, that um, further that information transfer uh, down uh, through the sales chain uh, to the local uh, individuals in the areas. That's great. And I actually had the uh, pleasure of attending some of the uh, education sessions that uh, mine and your colleague Jody Lawrence is involved with uh, different locations around the country. And I think as you uh, talk on both sides, both the, the, uh, the farmer side and the business side, you know, really one thing that Helena does exceptionally well is focus on education. 
you know, as I, I, I go to your website, I go to those events, you know, it was just a, a massive amount of information and science out there that the farmer needs a tremendous amount of help with. And so, um, you know, aside from serving beer and uh, some, some damn good food at those events, uh, you know, the, the people that attend actually end up you know, learning a tremendous amount. And, and you're also, uh, Jody tells me you're out on the road as well, um, really kind of at the forefront of a lot of the education effort. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Um, so my geography with Helena goes between Appalachia and the Rocky Mountains. Oh, cool. So I basically have the center, center, center part of the United States. So I have the Corn Belt. Um, and one of the most unique things I think about the central U.S. that a lot of people don't realize is the diversity of crops. Everybody thinks that it's corn and soybeans. Yes. Um, you know, we have Christmas trees. We have apples. We have cherries. We have um, yeah, go to Michigan. Holly, you get like cherries beans. up there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dry beans, potatoes. Um, so it's quite diverse. Um, and it's not just corn, beans, and wheat, which a lot of people think the central U.S. is. So um, I, it's a fun geography to cover, I guess is the way I would say it. Got it. And, and so let's, this is a great segue into just agronomy as a whole. You know, I, I kind of want to take a, somewhat of a level 201 direction here, ask some questions that I, I think are, uh, you know, interesting to the audience here and certainly questions that, uh, that, that I would ask, um, that I'm interested in. Um, so the, the, the chemists, the chemistry side of the seed and chemical development, it sounds to me like, because you work with the farmer, you're working with the business, you're also probably translating a lot of the information you get from those groups back to the chemists that are ultimately creating a lot of these, these, uh, these products. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, um, it's a fair statement. We get uh, some tra- information transfer both directions. Uh, yeah. What is it the customer having challenges with? Uh, what chemistries are in development that are out there that might solve that industry or that problem? And then on the reverse, how do we engineer that together in our product that can be used environmentally and safely uh, to the customer to solve that issue? So it's a two-way information street and and those of us like me kind of are in the middle of it, seeing traffic flow in both directions. Right. So, you know, as you're, you're having those conversations, you're talking about different soils and different soil types, different, um, you know, soil temperatures. You're talking about uh, different, different insects and other, uh, you know, elements of, of the regions. Um, you know, I guess at the grassroots, a seed is not really a seed anymore, right? A, a seed right. is built for very specific areas, for targeted um, uh, pieces of, uh, you know, uh, par- parts of types of soil, different soil temperatures. Um, can, can you just tell us, maybe take a quick step back and explain to the group and myself, you know, how, how we've gotten to the point where we're able to be very specific in, in those types of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, controlled, controls that develop into the seed? Yeah, so I always use soybeans as the perfect example here. Um, When I was growing up, um, soybeans were broadcast out of the back end of an airplane and (laughs) seeded into pastures to be used for cattle grazing. I mean, that was what the soybean was made for. Hold Um, on, hold on. So you're saying they would would spread the seed that way or they threw the bags out that way? No, they would spread the seed out of the back end of an airplane. Wow. Yes. Okay. Yeah. This is so, uh, you know, you take a soybean. Yeah. yeah. Uh, imagine a soybean seed. Think of a BB coming out of an airplane moving at who knows how many hundred miles per hour. Sure. You can get some pretty good seed soil contact when that hit, when that hits. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so we've taken soybeans from that uh, mentality, and by looking at um, how the plant grows, um, how it matures, um, when it flowers, how it flowers. Uh, we've been able to select that uh, soybean to the point where now, you know, we have group beans, beans that are growing in certain latitudes that's tied to really the length of night 
um, that that soybean encounters, wow. which is what triggers reproduction. It's not the length of the day, it's the length of the night that okay. triggers reproduction. And, and then farmers have further took that concept and they have manipulated that to where they treat, they uh, plant beans that are different maturity groups to help spread their harvest window out. So okay. things mature at a different rate so that everything doesn't mature at the same time. Um, so, so that's really a good example of how just selective breeding. I mean, there's no transgenics involved in that. That's just simply breeding techniques. Um, you, you've selecting. accelerated Darwin's uh, natural selection process. Correct. 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 Excellent. You know, in the case of corn, we have to remember that the native corn plant had the ear of corn as were today the tassel is. Got it. So the top of the corn plant was the ear. And you go back into the Mesoamerica time frame in Central America, they started selecting individuals and slowly that evolved to the 70s where we have a corn plant that looks the same. Right. And then we had the whole green revolution of being able to develop a hybrid where we take the pollen from a male plant and we put it on another plant that does not have any, has had the tassel removed and we create a hybrid corn that has a higher yield potential. Again, all that without being transgenics. Um, so that's so just, the trans gender, just to clarify, transgenics, you're saying this is natural. This would be, you know, like a non-GMO right. effort, correct? Correct. Correct. Non-GMO effort, effort. So, you know, then when you get into the, to the nineties, we start introducing the GMO traits to where we start taking uh, BT is the, was the, one of the first, which BT is an organically labeled pesticide okay. that organic producers can use on corn. And we inserted a gene into corn where the plant produces that itself. Got it. So this, this so, limits, just to clarify, that limits the need to add additional herbicides onto the plants or, you know, limits the number of sprays or uh, right. something along those lines. Right. Okay. Correct. And so, so once we understood that technology of, of how to insert genes, then you know, we started identifying genes uh, from different uh, plants or from, from bacteria, et cetera. And so that's where we have now developed where we have plants that we can spray herbicides on that don't kill the plant, but still kills the weeds around it, or right. it produces something internally that bugs don't like it uh, when they try to eat it. And so the bugs either die or avoid um, that plant. So that that's kind of the whole big picture evolution as far as corn and beans goes of, of kind of where they started, how we did what we did to a point, and then where science kicks in has been able to take that to the next step. And in the process, we have actually decreased the total pounds of pesticides that go into the environment or into the food situation um, because those plants are, have some defense mechanism built into them in a lot of cases. That's impressive. So, I think uh, more environmentalists need to uh, understand that because you know, that's truly an advancement in our, in our, you know, I guess in our technology, because what I'm imagining, if we don't do this, suddenly as our farmland and the amount of production has increased over the years, we're having more spraying, which means that you're going to have more runoff or at least more aerosols in the air, or whatever it might be that impacts the rest of the environment. But in this situation, we're going to be very targeted and not need to add on that extra chemical. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And, and also, also you charge more for the seed. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the marketing side of the equation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Good. Go ahead. You had something, please continue. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. Well, anyway, I think that, uh, that's, that's been a phenomenal, uh, ad advancement. And I guess, um, that it kind of bridges the conversation between, uh, that, I, that I wanted to ask next, the GMO, non-GMO, um, you know, everything you read, the people organic, how much advancement, um, um, I guess, how much growth have you seen on the, on the, the non-GMO side in the last number of years as, you know, it's become a, 
I don't want to put it out there as a marketing ploy, but the reality is you read the label, it says non-GMO, it says organic, people charge more that, but you know, right. it, it, you know, how are you guys uh, seeing that growth, that growth pattern affect your business? So, so the whole um, non-GMO market is definitely, uh, I mean, I will call it a niche market, although that niche gets to be pretty big in some geographies. Okay. Um, and that's because you have manufacturing plants that are drawing in that for a particular uh, purpose. Um, you know, the best example is white corn. Okay. White corn is, has been out there, but there are areas where white corn because there's a tortilla manufacturing plant that is not a niche there, that is a, a whole area is growing white corn to feed into that. Um, and that's, that's an example that we think of these as niche, that non-GMOs are a niche deal or just a small acreage deal, but in certain markets, they are the market um, that is there. And those have grown as this whole public perception of of GMOs being bad for you has has been promoted through mainly social media or or um, uh, people who have social influence um, into the to the public, and that has driven that business. And American agriculture isn't against it per se. Mm -hmm. um, it takes more time. Uh, it does take a higher input cost uh, because we can't rely on those genetics um, necessarily for some of the pest control situations. Um, and so that adds cost as well as labor. Right. Um, and so that does cause a higher input cost, um, but then there is that reaping of additional benefit um, to the marketing piece of this as a non-GMO containing product. Um, and, and we can't rule out the fact that there are some um, uh, not fair players in the field. Um, I go back to my dairy industry for an example, just a simple example, is that there are people charging more for a gallon of milk saying it's antibiotic free. Oh, yeah. I was just at Whole Foods the other day, $7 for a gallon of milk. Yes. Come on. Yes. Um, if it's just antibiotic free uh, and you're paying more for that, um, you cannot sell a gallon of milk in the United States that had test positive for antibiotics. Got it. So they're putting on the jug literally what is the regulation to produce milk, but right. they're charging a premium to it to the consumer because it makes that consumer feel better that there's no antibiotics in the milk, but there's no antibiotics in any milk that you buy. So, so that's the marketing piece sometimes that, that gets confounded in science. And that happens across any, any food category that you can see in the grocery store. Because there's not that many GMO crops um, that has ever been developed. Um, so, but yet when we look at ingredient lists or advertising, we see a lot of things that says non-GMO. And there's nothing that's in the ingredient list that there's even a GMO crop exists in that species of crop. Right. So, so there's some there's some not so couth marketing involved in some some aspects of that uh, system. So, for a farmer, they have to really understand all the inputs and all the work that goes into effectively deciding which seed they put in, depending upon you know if are they. Uh, doing no-till, are they doing a GMO farm or non-GMO, whichever farm. So they have tons of information that they have to digest. And that's where your team and the, the local representatives all really support that process, right? They're an advisor effectively to the farmer to help them through this minutia of uh, information in their area, their region. Is that, is that, uh, is that about right? That's correct. That's correct. And, and even goes beyond that, because in some cases, particularly in the, the specialty markets, mm -hmm. um, there has to be a record of what has been applied or grown previously in that field. Right. And so the farmer's records, as well as our records, come into importance 
if he wants to try something different in that field of what the marketability of that could be, not only from a pesticide carryover standpoint, but just simply from if they're trying to grow something that has an organic certification, right? what went on that ground for the past three years, will it let that crop be sold as an organic crop? So and further, there's than, a, oh, sorry, please continue. <clears throat> I was going to say, so so there's an important part of us advising and keeping our records, but as well as the grower themselves right. keep accurate records so that we can work as a team to help move that farmer into the direction that he's wanting to go from his desires to be more profitable in his operation. Yeah, that, that makes tremendous amount of sense. And I guess continuing a little bit further down the line here, there's a, a trend where you know, people want to know what farm the crop was raised from, you know, kind of a genetic yes. tracking or tracking. Do you feel that, yeah. you know, your team is somewhat behind the scenes with respect to your seed? Is it going to, are you going to somewhat, are you going to show up above the line um, and, you know, future needs of, uh, I, I guess, labeling? Is it going to say, right. hey, grown by Willoughby Farms using Helena, Helena yes. seed? Yes. And there's, there's two very good examples of that right now that's already out there. Okay. Um, the, there's a restaurant chain that's called Five Guys. Oh, boy. Yeah, you're hitting right at the heart. Uh, my my okay. daughter, she would eat Five Guys every day of the week. And even one, in fact, one day I took her there, you know, her mom said, take her to Five Guys. No big deal. You know, get what, get what she wants. And uh, she's at the time, I'm thinking eight, seven or eight, and she ordered the double and I didn't even know it. She, she took it down in a second. So uh, anyway, I mean, continue. It's, we, we know yeah. five guys, go ahead. Okay, so, so the five guys restaurant chain, if you go into their stores and you look, there's a sign on the wall and it will tell you where the potatoes were grown at that day. That day, yeah, so, Idaho and uh, you know, et cetera, yeah. Right, it tells the exact farm name yes. uh, of who grew the bag of potatoes. Okay, got it. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> I mean, that's that's where we are developing the opportunity to be able to go. Uh, it, it's it's definitely big in the vegetable side, but it is moving into the corn, soybean, and wheat side from a from a produce tracking uh, or production tracking system. Um, and then the other example is that. <clears throat> there are codes now on some food products. And if you run that code, it will tell you where it was, not necessarily the farm, but it will tell you what geography it came from. Okay. Um, so, uh, or where it was manufactured or bottled or whatever. So in some industries are starting to capitalize on that, that coding to try to promote people to buy locally. So you're going to buy, you know, a gallon of milk, let's look and see where that milk come from. Did it come from your local area? So you're, you're supporting the local market or was it grown or produced in another state and then transported in? So, so there's different ways that food uh, traceability is coming into to the situation, both from a individual farmer marketing their product specifically to let's support the local farming industry because this is where this product was produced from, from a geography standpoint. I love it. I think and it's in great. Cases, yeah, more information, the, the better. And uh, it's, it's good for the local economy. So. Quick segue into uh, uh, the last segment of this, this piece, which is the international market. You know, if you're talking about where seeds or food has come from, locally, what about from the international perspective? I mean, reality, if you look at right now, US corn average trend line 179, uh, you look at China, they're at 100 um, on their average yield on corn. What's it gonna take for the rest of the world to really catch up with, with, with America? Is it uh, a combination, you know, I guess, or maybe why are we so far ahead? Is it a combination of all the ingenuity you just described? plus uh, our machinery, our irrigation efforts, and just good old American hard work, and they're never going to catch us? Or does the rest of the world start to kind of uh, 
um, you know, be able to catch up to our numbers. So it's a little bit of all the things you just mentioned, actually. Um, so in the case of corn, for example, yeah, um, it was originally developed in Central America. Right. I mean, it's a native it's a native Western hemisphere. So we have had a long history of that crop. And so we are further ahead in advancement, if you will, of that crop versus the rest of the world. And, and the rest of the world is getting their stuff transferred from the Western hemisphere market over. To complicate that into your Chinese example with corn, uh, when we look at soil types and we look at uh, moisture regimes and temperature regimes, um, the central corn belt of the United States from a soil standpoint and a weather standpoint combination is some of the most productive combinations you can to have grow corn. Got it. So inherently the geography dictates us being a higher, heavier producer of that crop that will be hard for anyone else to come to compete with us. Despite um, the advancements in technology. Correct. We're always going to be ahead simply because of our, our location, geography, weather patterns, et cetera. Right. Correct. Um, I'll use wheat as a, as a contrast there. We do a good job growing wheat, okay? But we're nowhere near to the wheat production history of what they have in Western Europe or in um, the, uh, the West, uh, West Asia okay. because that crop again, it started there, but the climate that they have and the soils that they have, more climate than soils really, that geography is very productive for wheat. Rice growing. as well, probably, if you would uh, put in that category. So, yeah, so rice would be, you know, different geography, but a different weather pattern. Um, when I was at Purdue, we actually, uh, Lafayette is at the same latitude as some of the highest uh, rice producing regions in China. Okay. So when I was at Purdue, we actually had some Chinese researchers come over and we constructed a wet area for them to grow rice in because it's the same day length. It's the same weather pattern. It's, it's submerged in water. So soils don't necessarily enter into the, to the large conversation. How did, how did it shake out? I'm curious. It didn't. Oh, really? <laughs> It didn't. No, because we forgot one critical thing. Most of the Midwest is tile drained. Got it. So it's hard to flood an area when there's tile drainage everywhere around it. Right. Just just spreads so, out. Yeah, disperses. Spreads out. So, so again, if we want to go plug every tile line that there is in the Midwest and flood everything, we could probably grow rice. Right. But that's the only crop we could grow. So, so my point in those examples is that there is always a technological advantage to where that crop generally is developed at from a historical evolutionary standpoint, if you will. But second to that, weather and climate control everything. Right. I mean, Western Europe is like an Idaho, except it's multiple nations wide. Right. And Idaho is one of our highest yielding wheat areas in, the, in North America. Western Europe is like, it's all Idaho. Right. from a climate standpoint. So, so there's always that combination. And I think that's what leads um, into the interesting thing about agriculture is when we look at production numbers and we look at what countries are doing and how they're producing. And when Jody talks about his market analysis, yeah. um, weather is always a discussion point because there is that tie in between weather and soils and the species of crop. And when one of those three is used wrongly or it's affected disrupted, by something sure. yeah. disrupted, then it causes a yield impact. And that then rolls into the market price which of the grain, which then rolls into uh, the input prices right. um, that goes in to produce that. Because again, in the end, it's all about the return on the investment that that farmer is putting into his operation. That's great. Well, that's a perfect segue into the next section, which is current trends. So we may as well continue on with weather. Um, you know, you were talking before this, 
the uh, long-term forecast, you said, uh, well, I think we all know for, you know, paying any sort of attention is, uh, is a little unstable. So uh, maybe give us a, a current outlook as to what's going on here in, uh, uh, you know, the, the, across the country. So what's happening right now is we're in a transition. Um, there's an 80% chance that for the growing season this year, we're not going to be in an El Nino or a La Nina uh, weather pattern. Okay. And no what man's those land. Two days, All right. Right. We're in no man's land. <laughs> um, when we're in El Nino or La Nina, that typically gives us a cooler, drier, or a uh, wetter um, weather pattern setting in. So we kind of know which way we're going to go. But when we're in this neutral zone, we're not for sure how things are going to to develop. So the three month forecast, if you will, or the seasonal outlook gets to be a little hedgy. Um, so right now what we know is that uh, we have a severe drought in the Western part of the US right. that's moved into the Western part of the Corn Belt. And it is severe enough that it isn't going to change. It's probably just going to get drier as the season progresses. Um, because of where that's at and how that happens, um, there's a high likelihood that that drought area is going to grow eastward. And some of the predictions is that it's going to reach all the way to the Mississippi River wow. by the time we're through July. So, so the current forecast is below normal precipitation and increasing drought chances through the end of July all the way to the Mississippi River. That's the current forecast. Right. Two weeks ago, the forecast didn't take it quite that far. Okay. okay? So, so it is progressively getting a little worse from their modeling standpoint. On the flip side, um, the wetness that we're seeing now in the Eastern Corn Belt, um, right. I mean, just Down yesterday we got- as well. yeah. You know, I mean, we're extremely wet, okay? But in actuality, when you look at the root zone moisture, we're close to average in some areas are actually a little short on root zone, root zone moisture right now, even though we've gotten these heavy deluges of rain uh, just this week and then some areas got it a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So they're really calling for the rest of the corn belt, if you will, to be an equal chance of going wet or dry, leaning a little bit more wetter as you get into the Indiana, Ohio um, side of that uh, scenario. So in the big picture of things, um, it looks like from the, from the forecasting is that we're going to be dry on one side, wet on the other, wow. and 50-50 chance in the middle. So so that really makes us trying to figure out where our yields are going to end up being a little more complicated because it ties into the acreage that exists in each one of those geographies. Sure. That's right. And, and, so, and then in general, you know, you, you've, we talked earlier about seed, seed modification and uh, development. Is there also decisions that can be made this late in the game based upon current weather forecasts as to which seed might be going in. I think we're only at 46% plant, planted in corn and 24 in beans. Is it behoove a farmer to have waited till now to make a decision on their seed just purely on no. uh, weather? No, it doesn't. Um, in the long run, you're not going to outguess mother nature and the <laughs> And the variations we have within corn or within beans from, from being able to handle weather extremes um, isn't it worth the uh, effort to try to manipulate that minor piece. Um, that's one part of genetics that we really haven't got figured out very well. Um, we have made corn, for example, as a whole, much more resilient to weather fluctuations Okay. Uh, moisture fluctuations, heat fluctuations. So it's much more resilient than what it was, say, 10 years ago. Okay. But being able to say, hey, you know, this is, this is corn that worked really good in a drought. And if it's going to be a wet year, you should use this. 
uh, we, we've not progressed really to that point. But it may um, affect the chemical treatments or uh, those types of decisions, right? Right, correct. So, so and that's really where we as Helena, we think we come into this play is as we see these conditions develop, we try to modify what plans we have going on in place post planting, if you will, to be able to uh, maximize that. So, you know, a simple example, if, if you're in a geography that looks like it may be wetter than normal, we're going to try to talk to producers about using more protection for their nitrogen programs because yeah. wetness tends to lead to loss of nitrogen. So can we protect it? Can we space it out more? Can we foliar feed the nitrogen? What can we do there to help prevent loss of N? On the reverse, if we're in a dry area, there are certain elements um, that require water to move into the plant. So right. if we don't have irrigation and we're in a dry area, we're gonna talk about trying to foliar apply some of those elements to help nurse that crop along. Uh, long. Uh, we can't supply everything that the plant needs through the leaf, but we can help it through stress events or deficiency events with foliar applications for some elements. So that's where we try to come into working with the grower from a Helena perspective is trying to modify those programs in season or plan from a, uh, a retail standpoint of making sure we have those products available in stock in warehouses that if that develops, we can pull that in to supply the farm in a short time frame instead of waiting for something to be made or be shipped in from overseas or things of that sort. That's, yeah, it's truly amazing, right? It's, uh, it's, at that point, it's more of art than science, right? Or maybe still right. you feel a combination, but I mean, every field's different, right? Even in a small geographic right. area. Right, yeah, it's all about planning for the worst, hoping for the best. <laughs> yeah, the uh, eternal optimism of the farmer, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you right. know, here we are, we're basically uh, seeming like an average um, planting pace how, how does that typically impact, you know, if you're early, if you're average, if you're late, how does that typically impact yields long-term for that growing season? So, so in general, the earlier the corn goes in, um, the higher the yields go with okay. the exception of drought during pollination or okay. excessive nitrogen loss. Okay. So, so you take the temperature moisture out of it and you just talk about planting dates earlier planted corn tends to yield higher than later planted corn. On soybeans, um, it's one of the things that just recently we have learned, and by recent, I mean within the past, say, five years, uh, we used to think that, that soybean planting date, we had a lot more flexibility. Um, some recent work that was funded by the American Soybean Board showed that across multiple universities, found that there is a planting date issue. And if you are, if you are planting full season soybeans, um, you know, middle of May is really when you need to have those beans in the ground. I get them in, got uh, it. Yep. yep, and if you're planting full season and you go after the middle of May, there is a yield, a substantial yield hit um, to that plant because of that. So, so, so planting date does enter in, uh, beans, the earlier it is, the better is not necessarily, but there is a drop dead kind of date mm -hmm. of mid-May of when there's a major change in, in yield impact. Uh, whereas corn, the earlier tends to be the better as long as you're not, you know, going too early where, you know, you run risk of it freezing or, or things of that sort and, and perishing upon emergence. That's, uh, that's interesting. And it actually uh, leads in, I had a bunch of questions, but uh, this morning I posted a, a note out on uh, uh, Facebook grain market at market group and uh, asked, uh, you know, the, the group, Hey, I'm going to be speaking with, uh, you know, ag PhD yourself and ask them for some questions back. And I got a whole range of feedback. And uh, one of the questions was simply that is that, uh, you know, what issues um, is there planting beans, prior to corn other than frost. And you just kind of said, well, frost is the biggest thing. If it, if it freezes, it's in trouble. Yep, yep. And beans typically, uh, tip, beans can be planted earlier than what we normally think we can plant beans at. Um, 
I mean, as I said, we don't get stupid, uh, but I mean, we can plant beans at the same time we plant corn and have just as much success as we can of waiting until the end of April, 1st of May. Um, so so I, I, I have no problems with beans going, <clears throat> beans going into to the ground, um, you know, in, in, you know, the third week of April or, or even mid April, depending on the latitude that I'm in, I mean, that, that doesn't bother me in the least. Um, in addition, we typically overplant beans anyway. Um, if you look at some of the new work that's come out on optimal bean planting populations compared to where the average bean population is being planted at, um, we can lose several thousand plants and not impact yield at all. Uh, we, we tend to, farmers tend to overplant beans as a general rule okay. uh, across the, the across the spectrum. Well, they go ahead and they plant the planters, and they uh, send the plane up and drop a few more in, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got to realize when beans first came out into no-till, the population was you know two hundred thousand plus, okay. but it was for weed control. We didn't have any good options for weed control, so okay. you wanted cover the ground quickly. Well, as we've got better weed control options, we've pulled po populations back, but we've never pulled them back far enough to really see the, the optimum population because we still are used to seeing these fields covered, you know, having full canopy cover fairly quickly. And it's, it's a hard thing to mentally get your mind used to that I'm gonna still see the ground for several weeks right. into the growing season. Right. It's so, scary. It's a scary mindset. Yeah, it is. Everyone wants to it know, is. are you seeing any emergence? Yeah. You know, right. Is it, yeah. It's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Um, another question along those lines is uh, that can, again, came from the, uh, the post who said, uh, when is the best time to apply nitrogen to get your best bang for your buck? And they also want to know if biologicals are worth it. So on the nitrogen front, I, again, it's gotta be regional by region, right? to determine and, and weather related? Uh, not totally. Um, okay. there, is, there is old stuff and new stuff that really shows that the more you split nitrogen across a growing season, there typically is a yield response to that uh, division of nitrogen versus putting everything up front in front of the plant. Okay. Okay. Now, definitely, if you get into wetter conditions or you have poorly drained soils, um, how you separate those pieces out as far as the amounts that go in, in whatever timings you decide to do get shuffled. Um, but in general, um, it has pretty much been shown that spacing that nitrogen out, splitting it two or three times throughout the growing season, um, does have an economic advantage in the end from a bushel standpoint. Right. And I always bring up the point that you're then able to adjust your rates based on what the weather is showing you. Uh, if you see it's going to be turning dry, you may not want to put your original nitrogen amount out because you see you're going to be uh, hot and dry during the pollination window. So your yields are going to be impacted so you don't need as much in. So when you space it out, you actually have some flexibility to help adjust those rates based on the weather um, situation that you see coming, um, you know, 30 days out, let's say, I'm not talking three months, but you know, two, four weeks out, you can make some adjustments to that and, and could potentially save money slash make money. If the weather is good, you may want to put a little more nitrogen out than normal because your yield potential goes higher and you can capture that. That's yeah, that's interesting. And again, it comes down to uh, you know, working with the agronomist to determine, you know, how to do it. Plus, you know, if you've been doing it long enough yourself, you're going to kind of have a good feel for it anyway. So um, the, uh, the for the long term for the yield or sorry, for the uh, soil quality, how are the differences between saying, you know, the different anhydrous or percentage nitrogen, 28%. How does that impact the soil quality long-term was another question that came, came up. So, um, so actually this will loop back a little bit to your biological question uh, earlier. Um, biologicals that people are, are selling that tie into nitrogen production 
mm-hmm. um, is really still somewhat of an unknown area. Um, the research in the general sense isn't really consistent that um, they all work or they all work or it works all the time. Right. And so, so from my perspective as a researcher, I'm still in the let's walk before we run. Let's try it to get a feel for exactly what it can and cannot do. And part of that ties back to your question of soil health and soil quality. Yeah. Um, we know from work that's been done through um, the USDA's research facilities and other universities that soil quality affects nutrient cycling. And so if we have a strong biology presence, um, we can cycle nutrients better. Uh, That's where the whole cover crop conversation comes in of trapping elements before they move out of the zone into plant tissue and then it decomposing during the season and letting nutrients back out um, into the soil environment. So, So the whole soil biology piece and how that works between the amount of residue, the amount of tillage, um, and then your inputs. Um, So no doubt anhydrous ammonia is the most detrimental nitrogen source uh, that affects soil quality and soil biology. I mean, it it basically functions as a sterilant um, around that band um, and breaks down soil structure. Now the soil recovers, but you have impacted negatively the soil quality there. When you look at that versus UAN, 28 or 32, same difference, ammonium sulfate, urea, uh, ammonium nitrate, et cetera. Um, Those materials don't nearly impact soil biology. Uh, They don't really impact soil structure at all. Um, So they're much, I don't like the term safer, um, but they're, they're definitely more soil friendly Uh, nitrogen source than ammonia. Um, So there's a trade-off there. They're more expensive. Um, They may be easier to apply uh, than ammonia, but they also cost more. So there is a economic uh, piece to that. But from just a soil quality standpoint, uh, ammonia does does do some temporary damage and in a continuous operation um, compared to one of the other nitrogen sources the entire quality of that soil in, uh, section will decrease in comparison to, not that it's gonna get sterile or anything bad, but yeah. from a comparison standpoint, it is impacted more. Interesting. Well, we'll have to uh, keep track of how that evolves and you know what other chemicals kind of come up and that into the future. And that kind of takes us to the very last section and we'll wrap it up is the future of agronomy. I mean, I feel like We've accomplished so much in the last 30 years, if you kind of described throughout this podcast. I mean, I guess what's on the horizon now to kind of keep pace with increased trendline yields and uh, the growth and ingenuity of, of this business? What, what, is, uh, what do you see coming down the pipe that you know, the rest of us are you know, only dreaming about? I think- Don't give away the old going. company secret now. I know you've got the keys to the car there, so. So, so the thing that fascinates me the most is uh, I contrast uh, European agriculture to the American agriculture. Okay. Okay. Um, if you've ever been to Europe and looked at their agriculture or just paid attention as you drive through, I mean, we have to remember those soils have been farmed uh, intensively for thousands of years. Right. Okay. Um, North America, South America are relatively young in their agricultural development use. Right. So when we look at production, uh, a lot of times it's about uh, covering more acres faster, absorbing more acres from from smaller farms that um, decide to to cease that operation from, from the family perspective or another family absorbs it, et cetera. In the European model, it's all about trying to squeeze every bushel out of the footprint of the acres that they have. Right. And so, so one of the things that I see that still fascinates me is looking at things that they do, both from the plant health standpoint, from the soil health standpoint, 
um, all those things that farmers can do to increase production per acre and how do we scale that to a point where their 40 acre field that's the entire farm in Europe becomes the 4,000 acre field in North America. Right. Uh, the amount of technology and information they know that they can manage on a small scale um, is great science. And the real challenge I think is trying to figure out how to scale that to fit the American, South American model of production that's large acreage. Um, I think that's one of the most interesting things that, that we'll see develop. Uh, we've already seen a huge growth in, in plant health products or biological products. And most of that, it has some European background and origin. And I think that area is going to continue to grow um, and we're gonna to have to understand it better and to be able to utilize it to its fullest extent. That's, that's um, great. great information. I yeah, think I think, uh, you know, information sharing is obviously at light speed now. So hopefully we correct. can, uh, we can keep pace, right? Correct. Yeah. I think that's the most exciting area we've got not to take away seed technology or, or chemistry development from, from pest control or things of that sort. But I mean, we even see now some of the basic manufacturers, acquiring biological companies from Europe yeah. uh, and, and they're doing that. And then you start seeing uh, the most common thing we've seen now lately is the introduction of different types of biologicals into seed treatments uh, for sudden death syndrome, for uh, nematode suppression uh, in soybeans. Right. And they're not chemical uh, development their biological development, but it's coming from a company that is a basic chemical manufacturer who has an agreement with or has purchased a previous biological only company. So we're seeing that roll into the seed side uh, as a seed treatment first, but um, it's only a matter of time, I think, until some of that actually works its way into the, to the seed line from a genetic standpoint. Yeah. And then obviously, you know, more pods on the beans, more years on the corn. I mean, eventually, you know, if, if you want to get to 300 bushel corn, it's, it's, there's only so right. much growth in that area, right? It's either got to be taller, bigger, right. or fatter. So, yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you, you there's just, you either got to have more plants or you got to have more pods or more ears per plant Yeah, or both. That's the only way you get more bushel. That's the only way. Yeah. And land right. is land becomes sparse over time. So, oh, good. Greg, uh, Greg, this has been great. I got a couple uh, at the end here. We'll kind of wrap up, just close out fast questions. And then, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll let you go for the day. But uh, so, so here they are quick and quick and dirty. So if you had to farm anywhere in the country, where would it be? No, I don't want you to offend anyone. So this is your own personal preference. Um, actually, I would farm in Eastern Nebraska, probably. Okay. Irrigation, uh, it's good quality soil. You've got it all right along the aquifer. Right, exactly. Good quality soil, irrigation if you need it, but so you don't have to have it all the time. So you can control somewhat of your environment a little bit better. I like it. All right, good. Well, we're gonna be we're gonna see you out there hopefully at one of these events coming up once we're allowed to you know leave the office again. Right. <laughs> yeah. What, Let's hope uh, so. That's a, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what is your favorite podcast or book or blog to follow that kind of uh, uh, discusses agri agriculture trends? Oh, uh, you say you that's can really hard for me. That's fine. <laughs> well, I, I would say that uh, obviously this podcast, <laughs> um, you know, it's really hard from a researcher standpoint because. I try to absorb as much as I can from as many different sources. Um, I would say that, that there's not a particular source per se, but there are particular individuals that I look for okay. when they make comments or they make, make statements that I tend to take very seriously and put more weight into what they think than others. Okay. You have any uh, specific one that I tip everybody off to follow? Well, so Sean Connolly um, and Fred Bilo are two names that, that rank pretty high in, in my world okay. uh, from a corn and bean standpoint. 
Um, um, Sean Castile would be the, be another one. He's another soybean uh, guy. Those guys are at Wisconsin, Purdue, and Illinois. Um, those three individuals, I think, uh, set a trend of looking at things in a different fashion, um, from a more from a production standpoint necessarily than a environmental or a research standpoint. And I think that's important in today's world in that we have passed the point of single inputs being a controlling factor for production. Right. It's really how do things connect, get together. For example, planting date in soybeans and maturity group. Right. Okay. Either one's not important. It's how those two interact together. Um, you know, fungicides with nitrogen programs. How do those two things interact together? Right. Um, sulfur applications and timing of the sulfur. Uh, it's not about pounds, it's about winds. Um, so I think those three individuals are kind of the top of my list when I look to see um, how things are progressing. Not taking away from any other researchers that's out there necessarily, but those three tend to be more uh, syngentistic researchers looking for synergies between different systems than the basic research sciences are. That's great. Yeah, the University of Illinois, we know well, Scott Irwin has been on the podcast um, in the past and they do, a, they do a great job down there. So, um, you know, and the Purdue group as well, of course. So. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, I'm talking production. You start getting to weed science and pest science and that's a whole different group of people. And, and right. a lot of times that is where the basic science is. So, um, you know, you've got uh, the Kruger group, you've got the North Dakota group, you've got the Purdue group with um, Bill Johnson and um, Brian Young. Um, you've got Bradley out of University of Missouri. I mean, the, the weed science group are still, I'd still consider them more basic science type deals because we're trying to kill weed. Right. Um, right. Directly. Get rid of those um, pests. Whereas, right. Whereas the other three guys I mentioned are more production, seed selection, fertility programs, timings, uh, that kind of stuff together. And that's where I said I'm not taking away from the basis because it takes all of that together to produce that crop productively and profitably to the grower. Um, but each researcher has a different way about going about it. That's great. Well, I appreciate, uh, yeah, you dropping those names. I think uh, those would be some interesting groups for us to look into as well. And, um, you know, if we haven't connected with them, we will for sure following this. So uh, last question, completely off topic. And uh, so I will guess, uh, question I ask all the guests is, you know, if you, uh, if you had a favorite extreme sport, something that you've done or would do in another life, what would it be? Um, I've had all sorts of answers, good... so there's no wrong answer here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, extreme sport. Yeah. Skydiving. You could, uh, you could come up, you could, you know, cow tipping, you know, uh, I've had rugby, uh, you know, anything you could think of. You know, I think the one that fascinates me the most is what people can do with, uh, snowboarding. Yes. Extreme snowboarding. Um, just the physics involved in that and the coordination that has to happen, I think would, would fit my personality better if, if, if I was willing to do it, <laughs> we'll put it that way. That's great. Yeah. The flips and everything else that uh, they can do and the ability to jump off a, a rock or anything. Yeah. Right. Impressive. Correct. Yep. Very good. Well, Greg, no, this has been a great day. I really appreciate it. a ton of fun. Uh, how do we get in touch with you or how do our listeners get in touch with you and Helena? So um, if you're interested in anything from a Helena perspective, um, you can go to our website at uh, www.helenaagri.com. And there's actually a link there where you can submit a uh, question for information. Or you can tweet at us at, at Helena Agri, H E L E N A, and then A G R I. Uh, if you've got something particular for me, 
um, just send me a tweet or a message uh, at at G L Willoughby, W I L L O U G H B Y. And uh, the Helena site will get it directed to the right region of the country. And obviously, it's to me, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. That's fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much for the time. It was a great day here and perfect timing to be talking about all this, right? As we put the crop in the ground. So, well, um, if you don't mind, we'll ask you maybe get, catch an update, uh, you know, in a few months, just a short one to see, you know, what all happened and where, uh, where things are going. So thanks for the time, Greg, and uh, we'll do it again. Thank you for the opportunity. Look forward to seeing you again. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. You've been listening to The Hedged Edge. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at ag underscore RCM. Like our Facebook page under RCM Ag Services. And visit our website, read our blog, and subscribe to our newsletter at rcmagservices.com. If you like our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear them. 